Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile found... The telling of scary stories around a campfire is a tradition that is likely nearly as old as mankind itself. While tales of ghosts, goblins, and murderous psychopaths can rattle the cage of nearly anyone, what better subject for a campfire story could there be than a cannibalistic and murderous Sasquatch? The story of a haunted house might be creepy, but unless you're actually staying in the house in question, it is easily and quickly forgotten once the marshmallows and chocolate and graham crackers appear at the fire. Tales of a creature, a creature many people regard as being real, stalking the very woods in which you've pitched your tent, however, are not always so easy to put aside. One such terrifying tale is the story of a Bigfoot war that allegedly took place in eastern Oklahoma during the mid-1850s. The story of the LaFleur County Bigfoot War is one that I've heard bits and pieces of through the years. So let's take a look at the story and see what we can find out. It's said that in or around 1855, a band of Choctaws in what is now LaFleur County and farmers in what is now Arkansas were experiencing some terrifying events. It all began in a rather benign way when the theft of vegetables, a few head of livestock, and other food stuffed by stealthy bandits in the night. The thieves were cagey, quiet, and never seen. They were also smart as somehow they never ventured into Choctaw encampments on the nights when the watchman was in place. Neither did the bandits ever fall into the trap set for them by farmers outside of Indian territory. Those charged with finding and capturing these marauders began to develop a begrudging respect for the wiliness of their adversaries as time went by and the petty thefts continued. While the thefts were annoying and did cause some hardships, neither the Choctaw or the neighboring Anglo farmers were afraid of the food bandits. However, things changed once women and children began to go missing. Spurred by reports of these kidnappings, a group of 30 Choctaw cavalrymen were organized to hunt down the abductors. The group was led by Joshua LaFleur, a man of mixed Choctaw and French blood who was deeply respected by his fellow tribesmen. Also joining the search party was a Choctaw warrior named Hamas Tubby and his six sons. The Tubbies were huge men, all approaching seven feet in height and weighing in at more than 300 pounds each and were regarded as fierce warriors and expert horsemen. The Tubbies were so effective in mounted warfare that despite their massive size, they became known as the Light Horsemen. This contingent of searchers, armed to the teeth, set out into the region known today as the McCurtain County Wilderness Area to search for the kidnappers. After riding all day, the searchers finally arrived in the area where they believed the bandits to be hiding. LaFleur brought his troops to a halt, stood up in his stirrups, and surveyed the area with a spyglass. It is unclear exactly what LaFleur saw, but whatever it was, he ordered his men to charge toward a stand of pines, roughly 500 yards distant. LaFleur and the Tubby men led the attack. As the troops closed the distance between themselves and the stand of pines where the kidnappers were thought to be hiding, they were assaulted by a tremendous stench, the unmistakable odor of decay and decomposition. The horses of most of the men began to buck and rear, tossing their riders. Only the mounts of the floor and the tubby men were disciplined enough to remain composed, allowing the eight men to continue through the pines. As the men cleared the small wooded patch, they came upon a large earthen mound. Scattered across the mound were the bodies of children and women in various stages of decomposition. 
LaFleur and the Tubbies caught a glimpse of a number of the murderers fleeing into the tree line on the opposite side of the mound. Only three of the killers stood their ground to meet the charge of the light horsemen. It was at this time that the cavalrymen realized they were not going up against any human foe. Rather, standing before them, snarling and beating their chests, were three huge, hairy covered creatures. Despite what must have been a shocking sight, LaFleur drew his pistol and saber, spurred his mount, and charged. As LaFleur approached the nearest ape, it took a mighty swipe and struck his horse in the head, killing it instantly. LaFleur managed to roll off the falling horse, quickly jumping to his feet, and fired multiple shots into the chest of the creature. Once his pistol was empty, LaFleur attacked the ape with his saber, opening up gaping wounds on the animal which roared in rage and pain. LaFleur's assault on the creature was so quick and the shock of seeing hair-covered monsters so great that the tubby men hesitated, completely stupefied, before entering the fray. This delay allowed one of the other two apes to get behind LaFleur, who was intensely focused on the ape he had engaged. The second beast grabbed LaFleur's head with two huge hands and ripped it from his shoulders. The horrible sight jolted the tubby warriors into action, and they opened fire on the three Sasquatches with 50 caliber Sharps buffalo rifles. Two of the beasts were killed instantly, dropping in their tracks. The third creature was wounded but turned and fled till the lethal shot could be fired. Robert Tubby, only 18 years old but already 6 foot 11, and well over 300 pounds, spurred his horse, ran down the injured ape, and dispatched him with his hunting knife. As the rest of the troop, after gathering their panicked horses, joined them, the light horsemen surveyed the area. The bodies of dead women and children, mostly partially devoured, littered the area. The smell of decay, along with the terrible odor of the beast's feces, caused many of the men to vomit. After composing themselves, the men gathered the remains of the unfortunate women and children and buried them. They also buried their leader, Joshua LaFleur. As for the three ape-like monsters, their bodies were placed upon a huge bonfire and burned. Their hellish task complete, the Choctaw warriors returned to Tuscahoma, where it's said that the mighty tubby men were plagued by terrible nightmares for years afterward. It's one hell of a story. But is any of it true? We do know that the Tubbies existed. So too did a man named Joshua LaFleur. You won't find any official documents that LaFleur died in battle. In fact, outside of the realm of folklore, there's virtually no information to establish that the LaFleur County Bigfoot War took place at all. Having said that, it is possible that the LaFleur County incident was actually based on a real event that took place in a different location. According to a Bigfoot researcher named Jim King, the answer might be yes. King believes the LaFleur County story is based on an event that took place much farther west in Kiowa territory, an event related to him by an Indian elder. According to the story, Kiowa women were placed in a special teepee or tent on the edge of the camp when they started their menstrual cycle. The women stayed there being tended to only by older women until their cycle was complete. The elder told King that women were considered unclean during their cycles, and Kiowa warriors were not only forbidden any physical contact with females during this time, they were not allowed to even look upon them. This seems a bit harsh, of course, but it's not too different than the way many cultures treated menstruating women in the past. The elder said that once long ago there had been trouble with ape-like creatures who were attracted by the scent and pheromones emanating from the tent where the menstruating women were housed. Since the tent was on the edge of the encampment, it proved to be an easy target for renegade apes who were said to have entered and carried off women on several occasions. To make a long story short, the Kiowa leadership decided that this was unacceptable and put together a group of warriors to hunt down the kidnappers. The searchers did manage to track an ape back to its lair and killed not only it, but the entire family unit. Could the LaFleur County story have its roots in the tale told to Jim King by the Kiowa elder? Is there any truth at all, even the smallest grains, in either tale? I've heard that many put their faith in the LaFleur County version simply due to the name of the unfortunate Joshua LaFleur. 
They wouldn't have named the county after him if it wasn't true, and other similar statements abound. I, however, have not been able to find anything saying LaFleur County was named after Joshua LaFleur. According to the Oklahoma Historical Society website, the name honors the prominent LaFleur family of the Choctaw Nation. Could Joshua LaFleur have been one of the prominent LaFleur family? It's certainly possible, but there does not seem to be any documentation singling out Joshua or his actions as the reason for the naming of the county. The story of the LaFleur County Bigfoot War, even if totally fictional, does seem to point to the fact that enormous hair-covered ape-like animals have been thought to reside in the region for a very long time, a time long before the Patterson-Gimlin film brought Bigfoot into America's consciousness. Add to this the beliefs of many other Native American tribes from across the North American continent who have long told stories of these creatures snatching women and children and the anecdotal evidence that grows taller. Truth be told, the idea of child or a woman snatching Sasquatches continues to thrill, terrify, and enthrall us to this very day. It may very well be that the tale of the LaFleur County Bigfoot War was inspired by actual less dramatic events, like the Ape Canyon incident. Over the years, such a story would be embellished and grow to mythic proportions. It is all but inevitable, as a good scary story is irresistible. Don't be too hard on those who might have added to the original facts. After all, we all know that the most frightening types of campfire stories will always have one thing in common. They could really happen. Thank you for listening to the Shadowland Radio Show. If you're listening on the Blackwater Media YouTube channel, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. You can also listen at blackwatermedia.net and the Blackwater Media Facebook page. This story was originally published on the Texas Cryptid Hunter website, which can be found at texascryptidhunter.blogspot.com. I'm Dr. William Lester, and I promise to see each and every one of you again on the flip side.